Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to talk about when Moroni visited Joseph Smith. And you remember that he quoted a bunch of different scriptures to Joseph Smith. Well, somebody sent me an email where he points out something that I never noticed um, in one of those quotations. So the email is from Tyler Warner. The subject line, Moroni told Joseph about who would burn who in the second coming. Who would burn who? Uh, that caught my eye. I was like, what are, what are you talking about? Okay, so he says in the body of the email, I know you're busy. Uh, true. Good good job. I have just made a side-by-side -side comparison between Malachi 4 and what Moroni quoted to Joseph Smith. One of the more shocking parts is this. And I'm just going to read the part that's highlighted. For they that come shall burn them. So a lot of times when we think about the second coming, we think about uh, if the fire is caused by Christ in his glory, then it's coming from Christ. Uh, you know, we think of Christ as being the source of the, the burning, I think, most of the time. Well, in this, where Moroni quoted this scripture to Joseph Smith, he said, for they that come shall burn them. Uh, and then the last part of the email Love your channel. I watch it all the time. Thank you for your work, Tyler Warner. Thank you, Tyler. I'm glad that you enjoy the channel. And um, we are going to look into this a little bit more because that sounds kind of, uh, it, it doesn't really specify who the, who the they is. And so I wanted to find out. So before we do that, I have an update on the Flood the Earth Challenge. I haven't updated it for a few days, mostly because I've been busy with Thanksgiving activities. I hope you guys all had a th good Thanksgiving those of you that celebrate it here in the United States. So uh, we've only had some marginal gains since the last time. There's been two new people that have joined the challenge, which brings us to 777, which that's a great number. I know we all like uh, numbers like that. And then uh, we have a total of eight new shares of the copy of copies of the Book of Mormon, which brings us to 7,323 total. So let's keep marching forward, trying to get to 10,000 total. And we're trying to at least get to 1,000 people that have joined the challenge. Um, it's my fault. I, I should have brought the challenge up more in the last several videos, but it's, it's hard to keep on top of everything. But that's where we're at right now. Okay, so this is what I want to do. I want to uh, investigate who the they is. And then I want to talk about the burning at the second coming and kind of uh, review what we know about that fire. And then I want to talk about the different verses that were quoted to Joseph Smith, these different prophecies, and where are we at with them being fulfilled and what was supposed to be fulfilled. And it's really interesting. So, okay, so first, <clears throat> let's, re let's go ahead and read the full verse. Joseph Smith, History 1, verse 37. For behold... The day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall burn as stubble. For they that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall be that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Okay, so let's do this. Let's see what it uh, looks like in the King James Version and how it uh, reads over there. So this is from Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, uh, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So that is something that was changed from the King James uh, compared to what Moroni quoted to Joseph Smith. We have this, um, I guess, corrected verse, this uh, restored information that there's a they. So, like always, if I have a question about <clears throat> a particular uh, verse or verses in the scriptures, uh, I like to go to the scripture citation index, which allows you to... Um, let me just show you in case there's people that don't know. There's this website called the Scripture Citation Index. You have a question about a scripture over here on the right. You go to the book. You find the chapter. You go to the verse. 
And then it shows you all the different times that this verse was quoted or cited in a general conference and also the, the journal of discourses, as well as um, anytime it match ups, matches up with things in the scriptural teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. So for example, Malachi chapter four, verse one was most recently cited by uh, elder Quentin, Quentin L. Cook in a talk called roots and branches. And then you can read the talk and see what he said about that verse. And this is a good way to understand uh, what these verses mean and how our church interprets them. When we're left to our own devices, we can come up with all sorts of wild ideas. So it's best that we stick to the words of the prophets and apostles and stick to church doctrine. And this is one way to do that. And so when I looked this up, uh, there's only one where it kind of, where it actually defines who they are. So this is from the October 1967 General Conference, uh, The Importance of Temples is the name of the talk, by Elder Theodore M. Burton, Assistant to the Council of the Twelve. Okay? So, he says, The first instruction Moroni gave uh, concerned the end goal toward, toward which we are working. When Malachi prophesied of the second coming of Christ, he spoke of the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, of whom was he speaking? First, of those who rejected Christ because of the pride of their hearts, and second, of those who, having accepted Jesus, were not valiant in keeping his commandments. Malachi went on to say that they shall burn as stubble. This means that they shall be destroyed. By whom? Malachi explains, They that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts. Those who come are, th <clears throat> are those righteous hosts of heaven and righteous persons caught up from the earth who shall come in return with the glorified resurrected Savior to cleanse the earth. So that's what that's referring to. It's those that are coming with Christ, those that are part of the, re the first resurrection, as well as those that are caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven, the way that the scripture reads. So that whole host, as they come, uh, that's what's going to be doing the burning, according to um, the way that according to the way that Moroni quoted that scripture. So that's an interesting thing to think about. I'm sure that the primary source would be Christ Himself like when we're talking about the burning, but it's essentially that event which this clarifies. It's going to I don't know, and maybe this kind of gives us uh, an idea of like how the burning is going to take place because there's been a lot of like little details that I haven't been able to iron out. And uh, frankly, I think we don't have the answer for a lot of different things, but this might be an answer. And of all places, it's in Joseph Smith history where it would seem that essentially when that burning takes place, it's going to take place as we uh, assuming that we're righteous enough and we're uh, r worthy enough to be caught up, that we would be with Christ coming to the earth uh, for for the final appearance, I would assume, the, the appearance to the world. And I, I guess maybe at that time, that's when the burning happens and we would witness it, I suppose, with him uh, up in the sky. I, th these are things I don't really know, but that's kind of what I, that's what I picture. Um, let me just read the rest of this. But what is meant by the extra? Okay, but what is meant by the expression that uh, shall leave them neither root nor branch? This expression simply means that wicked and indifferent persons who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ will have no family inheritance or patri patriarchal lineage, neither root, ancestors or progenitors, nor branch, children or posterity. Such persons cannot be received into the celestial kingdom of the, sorry, into the celestial kingdom of glory of resurrected beings, but must be content with a lesser blessing. Okay, so that's really interesting. Um, so with that in mind, with that little bit of information, that the burning will take place as the resurrected and caught up saints are with Christ. Let's see what we have on my quotes A through Z spreadsheet. 
under um, this row that I have titled Fire at the Second Coming. And we're going to work our way backwards uh, from most recent to the oldest. Okay. Okay. So first I have this from Seminaries and Institutes of Religion Curriculum Services, Doctrine and Covenant Student Manual of Religion. Okay. There you go. This is what it says. The wicked shall be burned as stubble. In this passage, <clears throat> sorry, is this passage figurative or will the wicked really burn? President Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, it is not a figure of speech that is meaningless or not or one not to be taken literally when the Lord speaks of the burning. All through the scriptures, we have the word of the Lord that at his coming, the wicked and the rebellious will be as stubble and will be consumed. Isaiah has so prophesied, surely the words of the Lord are not to be received lightly or considered meaningless, end quote, from Church History and Modern Revelation, Volume 1, page 238. Christ is a glorified celestial being, and the glory of such beings is comparable to that of the Son. The presence of Christ, when he comes in his glory, will be as a consuming fire, the mountains will flow down at his presence, the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the waters will boil. Even the sun will hide its face in shame. The scriptures also talk about the time when devouring fire will be poured out upon the wicked. So, in this sense, you know, what the manual is suggesting here is that it's because he's a, a resurrected celestial being. And that would be the same case with all those that are part of the first resurrection, because we know that there's an order to um, the resurrection. Those that are celestial are resurrected first. Later on in the millennium, those that inherited terrestrial glory, they'll be resurrected. And then at the very end, after the millennium, just before the, the earth itself uh, becomes a celestial sphere, that's when the telestial resurrection is going to take place. So... You have Christ, a celestial being, as well as all the other celestial beings with him. And then those of us that are caught up, which um, I don't think it'll be because of because of that group that there will be burning, but they'll be there to, to witness it as, it as it happens, it seems. Okay, this next one, this is from the Institute Manual for Old Testament, uh, page 208. Jesus Christ is a celestial being. Since the sun is typical of the glory of the celestial kingdom, the imagery of burning and fire that describes the second coming could actually be caused by the glory of Christ's person. Okay. Now we have Bruce R. McConkie, uh, Millennial Messiah. This time he will come in flaming fire. The vineyard shall be burned, and every living soul on earth shall know that a new order of worldwide dimensions has been ushered in. In flaming fire, what kind of fire? Flaming fire is flaming fire. It is actual, literal fire that burns trees, melts ore, and consumes corruption. Okay, next one. This is from Charles W. Penrose um, in the Millennial Star, an article called The Second Advent. Uh, he went on to become... Uh, a member of the first presidency. All right. He says he comes, the earth shakes and the tall mountains tremble. The mighty deep rolls back to the North uh, as in fear and the rent skies glow like molten brass. He comes, the dead saints burst forth from their tombs and those who are alive and remain are caught up with them to meet him. The ungodly rush to hide themselves from his presence and call upon the quivering rocks to cover them. He comes with all the hosts of the righteous glorified, the breath of his lips strikes death to the wicked. His glory is a consuming fire. So he kind of he kind of says it right here, his glory is a consuming fire. The proud and rebellious are as stubble; they are burned and left neither root nor branch. He sweeps the earth as with the besom of destruction. He deluges the earth with the fiery floods of his wrath, and in the filthiness and abominations of the world are consumed. Satan and his dark host are taken and bound. The prince of power of the air has lost his dominion. For he whose right it is to reign has come, 
and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Okay. And then I added uh, this scripture that, that we're reading out of Joseph, out of Joseph Smith history. Um, let's read just a couple more. Let's read some, well, yeah, let's read these scriptures that I have that are associated. DNC 133, 40 to 44 and verse 49. Calling upon the name of the Lord day and night saying, Oh, that thou wouldst rinse the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. And it shall be answered upon their heads for the presence of the Lord shall be as the melting fire that burneth and as the fire which causeth the waters to boil. O Lord, thou shalt come down to make thy name known to thine adversaries, and all nations shall tremble at thy shall tremble at thy presence. When thou doest terrible things, things they look not for. Yea, when thou comest down, and the mountains flow down at thy presence, thou shalt meet him who rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, who remembereth thee in thy ways. And then skipping to verse 49. And so great shall be the glory of his presence, that the sun shall hide his face in shame, and the moon shall withhold its light, and the stars shall be hurled from their places. Okay. DNC 86, verse 7. Therefore, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe. Uh, then ye shall first gather out the wheat from among the tares. And after the gathering of the wheat, behold, and lo, the tares are bound in bundles, and the field remaineth to be burned. Dean C. 60, 64, verses 23 to 24. Behold, now it is called day until the coming of the Son of Man, and verily it is a day of sacrifice and a day for the tithing of my people. For he that is tithed shall not be burned at his coming. This is the, the fire insurance uh, verse. And after today cometh the burning. This is speaking after the manner of the Lord. For verily I say, tomorrow all the proud and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble, and I will burn them up. For I am the Lord of hosts, and will not spare any that remain in Babylon. And by the way, uh, I would recommend to take that seriously when it comes to when it comes to tithing. Um, th this is one of the commandments that, like in this verse, it's specifically tied to being burned at the second coming. So you probably don't want that to happen or or play around with that. So I, I don't know. I would just encourage you to pay your tithing. DNC thirty five fourteen. In their arm shall be my arm. And I will be their shield and their buckler, and I will gird up their loins, and they shall fight manually for me, and their enemies shall be under their feet. Uh, and I will let the, <clears throat> I will let fall the sword in their behalf, and the fire, right there, the fire of my indignation, will I preserve them. Um, okay, I'm not going to read the rest of these. It's, it's just too much, but there's many references of fire and burning at the second coming. So, yeah, it is a literal thing, and it would seem, based on these statements, that it's going to be uh, Christ and his glory. And then if you take into account Joseph Smith history, um, Moroni quoting Malachi, uh, potentially also the glory of, of resurrected beings. And, yeah, it seems like that's what's going to happen. So from here, I want to I want to read this section of Joseph Smith history where he quotes all the different scriptures. Um, it's just a few verses. And then we're going to look at this interesting table in the Institute manual where it breaks it down and which ones have been fulfilled or, you know, what was said about them, about these different passages of scripture. And we'll take a closer look. So, okay. After telling me these things, he commenced quoting the prophecies of the Old Testament. He first quoted part of the third chapter of Malachi, and he quoted also the fourth or last chapter of the same prophecy, though with a little variation from the way it reads in our Bibles. Instead of quoting the, the first verse as it reads in our books, he quoted it thus, and we've already covered that. I'm not going to repeat that again. And again, he quoted the fifth verse thus, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood, by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So I'm going to pull this up. We're, we're going to come back to 
he said first that he read part of the third chapter of Malachi. I'm going to wait until we're, we're in the Institute Manual to cover that, but I'm going to go ahead and look at this, for, this uh, fifth verse in chapter four of Malachi, and let's compare it. So what it says in the King James Version is, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In the way that Moroni quoted it, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood. And that's like the key part right there. I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay. He also quoted the next verse differently. Let's read that first in King in the King James Version. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So this is the way that Moroni quoted it. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. So that's interesting because the way that he quotes it, uh, there's nothing about the hearts of the fathers turning to the children or, or nothing from the fathers to the children. It's planting in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and then the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. So that's interesting. And and we recognize that, right? This is one of the most famous verses in um, in the church because it has to do with family history and doing uh, vicarious ordinances for the dead. Okay. In addition to these, he quoted the 11th chapter of Isaiah saying that it was about to be fulfilled. And I think we're going to wait until we're in the Institute Manual for that as well. He quoted also the third chapter of Acts, uh, 22nd and 23rd verses precisely as they stand in our New Testament. Okay. So let's look at that. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Okay. So he read that. He said that the prophet was Christ, but that the day had not yet come when they who would not hear his voice would be cut off from among the people, but soon would come. He also quoted the second chapter of Joel from the 28th verse to the last. He also said that this was not yet fulfilled, but was soon to be. So let's read this. And we've actually talked about this uh, quite a bit, but we're going to do it again in this video. Uh, if you're new, maybe you don't know about this, but we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh in your daughters and your sorry in your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show great wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass, sorry, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, what's interesting is, and you can see it right here in the same footnote, that there was a fulfillment of this as recorded in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2. But, Moroni said that it has not been fulfilled yet. So it must not have been fully fulfilled at the time of uh, Acts. So let's read what it says in Acts, uh, verses 16 to 21. But this is what, okay, but this is that which was spoken by the, the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, 
I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call, shall call, a, sorry, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And actually, just so we're clear. Okay, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But these, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's referring to what's happening at that moment. And what was happening? The Spirit, the spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so you had people there speaking in tongues and stuff like that. And Peter um, says, look, no, this is prophecy being fulfilled. This is what Joel was talking about. But the angel Moroni said right here, he also said that this was not yet fulfilled, but was soon to be. So it seems, like I said before, there was a partial fulfillment at the time of Peter and during Pentecost. But at the time of Joseph Smith, it was not yet fulfilled. But... Uh, it has been fulfilled at this point, and I'll show you when that happened. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the Institute Student Manual, okay, for these verses that we just read. It says, okay, the prophet, well, first, it, it, this section is called, What is the Significance of the Bible Verses Mor Moroni Quoted to the Prophet Joseph Smith? The prophet Joseph Smith said that Moroni quoted many passages of scripture to him. Following are the Old Testament prophecies that the prophet specifically identified. And then you have this table. So on the left, you have the scripture reference. On the right, comments made by Moroni or Joseph Smith. So part of Malachi 3, and it doesn't specify what part, but it wasn't the whole chapter, but we don't know which verses. <clears throat> Okay, Malachi chapter 4, verses 1, 5, and 6. Uh, wording varies from the King James Version biblical text, and we already covered that. <coughs> we looked at the difference. Isaiah 11, um, and the comment here is that it was, it was about to be fulfilled. So we'll read that in a little bit. Acts chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. The wording of King James Version biblical text precisely matches Moroni's quotation. The prophet referred to is Jesus Christ. The day had not yet come, but soon would come, that they who would not hear Christ's voice would be cut off from among the people. And then Joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 32, not yet fulfilled, but soon would be. Okay, so these this is what was said about these verses at the time that this was taking place and as recorded in Joseph Smith history. Okay, Joseph Smith also added that Moroni said, the fullness of the Gentiles was soon to come in. We do not know uh, which verses Moroni quoted from Malachi 3, but verses 1 through 4 and 16 through 18 are appropriate to the themes of the other scripture references. So, let's take a look at that then. So, verses 1 through 4, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may, they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Okay, and then 16 and 18. 
Then they that feared the Lord, okay, sorry. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord in that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I, t- when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Okay. Isaiah 11 is also quoted in 2 Nephi 21, and an explanation of parts of of Isaiah 11 is in Doctrine and Covenants 113, 1 through 6. So first, let's go through Isaiah 11. There's only 16 verses, and then we'll see what it says in Doctrine and Covenants 1 through 6. Chapter heading, The Stem of Jesse or Christ, will judge in righteousness. The knowledge about God will cover the earth in the millennium. The Lord will raise an ensign and gather Israel. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord." And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteousness, sorry, in righteousness shall be shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox, or like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, uh, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the island, the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom. Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his might wind shall he, sorry, with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Okay. So DNC section 113 verses 1 through 6 has something to say about that. Who is the stem of Jesse spoken of in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth verses of the 11th chapter of Isaiah? Verily thus saith the Lord, it is Christ. What is the rod spoken of? in the first verse of the 11th chapter of Isaiah, that should come from, come of the stem of Jesse. Behold, thus saith the Lord, it is a servant in the hands of Christ who is partly a descendant of Jesse as well as of Ephraim, or of the house of Joseph, on whom there is laid much power. What is the root of Jesse spoken of in the 10th verse of the 11th chapter? Behold, thus saith the Lord, it is a descendant of Jesse as well as of Joseph, unto whom rightly belongs the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom for an ensign and for the gathering of my people in the last days. 
Okay, so the prophecy about Jesus Christ in Acts uh, 3, 22 to 23 is one of the most frequently mentioned prophecies in the scriptures. It says, for, uh, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. The Lord taught the Nephites that prior to the second coming, there would be a sign given in the last days that would signal the beginning of the gathering of Israel in power. That sign is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. All of the passages Moroni quoted point to the same theme. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon will initiate a progression of events that will lead to the second coming when the wicked shall be destroyed and the righteous will reign on the earth with, with Jesus Christ. In essence, Joseph Smith was being told that the work he was to do would help usher in Christ's millennial reign and that the Savior's coming would be, quote-unquote, soon. Okay, so let's talk about these prophecies again. So... <clears throat> Um, this last one, it says, he specifically said it was not yet fulfilled, the Joel prophecy. And we've talked about this before. The interesting thing about this is that President Hinckley said that it was fulfilled. He said it in the October 2001 General Conference. And this was less than a month uh, from the time of 9-11. 9-11 had happened within the last 30 days of this General Conference and his first talk is this one, and it's called Living in the Fullness of Times. Okay? He says, The era in which we live is the fullness of time spoken of in the scriptures, when God has brought together all of the elements of previous dispensations. From the day that he and his beloved son manifested themselves to the boy Joseph, there has been a tremendous cascade of enlightenment poured out upon the world. The hearts of men have turned to their fathers in fulfillment of the words of Malachi. It's like he's, it's as though he is thinking about Joseph Smith Matthew, or sorry, Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith history and what we just read. Um, especially, you know, how it was summed up uh, in this last paragraph where basically what was being told Joseph Smith is that the Book of Mormon would start everything the gospel would go forth, everything would be prepared for the second coming uh, before that great day. And President Hinckley seems to have that in mind because he, he then says, the vision of Joel has been fulfilled, wherein he declared. And then maybe we'll read it again, but he just point blank says it. The vision of Joel has been fulfilled. So, in Acts, with Peter, he said that it was fulfilled or that it was at least part of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel at the day of Pentecost. When you had that meeting taking place, people were speaking in tongues. But then Joseph Smith is told by Moroni that it was not yet fulfilled, but was soon to be. And then the October 2001 General Conference President Hinckley says the vision or the vision of Joel has been fulfilled. And then to make sure that everybody knows what that was, he quotes it. He reads it to everybody. Just so that there's no question about what vision or what this uh, scripture was so that everybody knew what had been fulfilled. So let's read it. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And then he puts the reference Joel chapter two verses 28 to 32. So this was really big. 
this was really big. Essentially, all these things um, that are mentioned here, all these different prophecies have taken place, with the exception of the second coming itself. So that's a really exciting thing. October 2001, that was really exciting because it checked off this box right here. Again, at the time of Joseph Smith, not yet fulfilled, but soon would be. And then by October 2001, check, it was. So really interesting. Uh, hopefully we all learned some new things. Sorry if you can hear my son screaming in the background. Hopefully we learned some new things I did. Um, but that'll be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.